I grew up with only Morris dancing as the, and, and the music of Morris dancing as the main folk in my life. Um, I didn't really know about any of the rest of the folk scene or any of the singers particularly. My mum had a couple of Martin Carthy and Nick Jones records but they never got played because the record player was under a load of rubbish in my house. And then only when I started playing did I realise that it, there was this whole genre of music and I knew some of it. <laughs> The opposite of that, in a way, in so far as um, we did have a few folk records. My parents did play Steel Ice Band mostly, um, but the Planksty, a bit of Jethro Tull, if that counts, you know, that sort of end of things. Um, so, so I grew up listening to it, but I had absolutely no involvement with it as a scene at all. Um, parents certainly weren't Morris dancers, and uh, you know, first time I went to a folk club, I was 22. You know, and first time I went to a folk festival when I was about the same. And you originally met in Oxford, was it at the Half Moon? No. No, it was, it was the previous incarnation of the Half Moon, the Elm Tree. Much same bigger, landlord. Same landlord, much bigger pub. And I was living just a few doors down from that pub. And I was in a particular Irish session that John turned up at. I know I was doing, doing music for a play in Oxford and um, had a night off from rehearsals and uh, had heard that it was a good session there. We swapped phone numbers at the end of the night, just I think more because everyone else in the room was saying yeah. you should probably. I guess people it w were aware that it was yeah kind so of an obvious really, pairing. In a yeah, way, we didn't it? do much playing together apart from the tunes that we knew together in that session. And then well, the thing is, I didn't actually know very much English music at all at that point, like in terms of instrumental music, I sung English songs but I thought of myself as, as an Irish fiddler more than anything else. We rehearsed things like, I don't know, some of the stuff that we still do now, something like Rambling Cellar and... Yeah, Rambling Cellar was one of the first we did, wasn't sets. it? But we played quite a lot of French Canadian stuff because that was a bit of common ground between me being an Irish fiddler. And of course with Nandy Cutting. Range, yeah, so. there were. So we, we learned quite a lot of Chris and Andy stuff, didn't we? Them. Yeah, yeah. But we figured out pretty soon that that wasn't going to uh, yeah. get us very far because we just were a not very good version of Chris Wood and Andy Cutting when we, <laughs> when we did uh, French Canadian stuff. So we, so we stopped it. I did learn to do that though. chance they had a hollow stage and and we asked if you could mic your foot up. We, we had been micing my foot up just but just but as just, a tap. With, just with a microphone yeah. pointing at his foot on the floor. Um, and they found that this particular microphone that they tried just randomly just made this incredible big bass drum, drum sound, which is more like you hear when you stump into a hollow Board. Which you hear in a session, I mean that's the thing, is, yeah. is when you go to a session with a, with a hollow floor and everyone's doing that, it sounds exactly like a big, big fat bass drum. Yeah, yeah. since learning the melodeon I always you know, sort of play it more like a, a bass guitar and so the two things meld really nicely together sonically, which is one thing we don't hear on say through and through because we didn't do that then and we weren't aiming for that sound but now when we do something that is our sound. In the beginning I presume you had to do sorting out the bookings, um, sending out mailings or anything like that. How did you divide that work up? John did it all. I do it. <laughs> I still do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It hasn't changed that much. No. Um, well, I know that obviously we don't do our own bookings and uh, it was so ad hoc at the beginning. You know, you kind of, I, I made a website that wasn't very good and, and I had a thing saying, do you want to book us? We've got quite a few bookings yeah, that way, haven't we? We've got three or four bookings that way, yeah, some little yeah. phone festivals for peanuts and stuff Just like that. Just phoned around initially people that we knew, I suppose, so I phoned a few people and you knew quite a lot of people yeah. from working in the music room and, and knowing the festivals and stuff. Yeah, and the fact is right, at the beginning we really just wanted to play and try it out in front of people anyway, so it's not as if you know, 
We weren't very driven, were we? In a sort of, we got right. We, now we're going to become professional musicians. Oh, he shot up and he shot down the bird along the briar. He sent it home to his gay lady, told her be all shit. We did a bit of a charity gig, and we uh, got quite a long way to do it. Do you remember that one? And we and. Uh, that everyone else had overrun, and we were on just for the headline. And we, could, we, we, we were supposed to do 20 minutes, and we did one song, I think. And then they went, That's lovely! We're right? <laughs> oh, yeah, so it's quite a little gig, like, it? yeah, a few gigs like that where you just sort of go, Okay, right, well, we'll be off then. <laughs> sort of less, less than a floor spot, really. But there we go. Yeah, no, but the first album made a big, big difference. Well, it was Paul Thomas. If we did an album with him, we had to get an agent who'd get us proper bookings because we wouldn't sell any CDs otherwise. Well, sorry, it's Paul Adams from Fellside. Uh, um, he, yeah, him and Linda sort of ran, ran the whole business of they did our first four CDs, and they, they were sort of saying, Well, yeah, we've agreed to do a CD with you, now you've got to sell them. <laughs> we said, Well, we didn't think about that. Yeah, no. <laughs> you don't really realise until you get to, to the the business, how it works, but it, it basically is that you sell your own CDs until you get to. I mean, even even now, we we still sell more CDs on the road than through shops as a duo. It's probably about half an hour. About half an hour. Yeah. Whereas now, where Bellhead is, that's different. You get the fish; they sell. You know, Bellhead we sell through the shops, and it's a whole different sort of industry. But really, up until you know, sort of the level we're at now, really, it's, it's at having a shop. Yeah. that you take with you isn't it and that's how a lot of labels function as well their, their main s selling distributor is the artist that have made the album for them you know and, and and that's how it works and it works works very well but it's um you have to kind of understand that before you yeah. get into it it's yeah, quite easy to think uh okay so i've made a record now the money comes yeah in. yeah now where's my house <laughs> where's my house and my car <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah, which doesn't work at all, which doesn't work like that. And even, to be honest, once you get into the selling and shops, thing, it doesn't work like that because then... You get much less per <laughs> You get much less per and you have to spend more money on, on all yeah. the advertising and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's very different to perceptions of... of, of uh, it's not a job to go into for money, basically. No. Sitting down. Really? Yeah, that's true. Actually, yeah. I'd have a special cushion for my feet to stop stamping out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, stop the house shaking as well. Yeah. <laughs> so you, when you got to the editing thing, and we we're like, oh, it's a shame because the first half of that track is really good, but of that take is really good, but the second half of that take is really good. If only there was some way you could combine <laughs> the two. Wow. And Paul's like, well, you know, yeah. and, and I was like, oh, I can't believe you could do that. Yeah. That's but, cheating. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was a fairly basic edit, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, it, it was like magic. It was incredible. Well, you mentioned that when you started playing together, you were holding down proper jobs yeah. at the same time. Did that prove difficult as you started to get more? Um, it was the tour in Australia with Eliza that killed my job for me. When you start suddenly say, I've got to go away for a month, can yeah. I have a month off, please? Um, it's when you sort of well, I, I thought it would be polite to resign at that yeah. point rather than I can ask. do even better than that. You can have an indefinite amount of time <laughs> yeah. off because you're fired. No, but, but you no, resigned, yeah. it. And I kept going back and uncovering for them when I was back as well. So it wasn't yeah. a complete turnaround. But yeah. yeah, we gave my job to Ian Giles. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, Ian Giles had it for a while. It wasn't, a, oh God, I can't wait till I can quit my day job. I, re I really didn't want to. In fact, about, weirdly, about six months before I gave up all my day jobs, I'd just taken on a whole load of extra teaching. I started doing peri, peripatetic teaching in the schools. So I was doing five days a week um, teaching, and then yeah, it, it just was everyone. It was scary at first not having that day job because at least you know you can yeah. get money from it. Whereas you know you can, your diary's only filled up so far ahead, and then you don't just go, well, there's nothing there after that. It's scary. But, it's, it's but you just most people at the moment. Yeah, really good, uh, and you, pe people just get. You just end up, everyone, you know, you just end up not being able to do any of the jobs 
well enough because you're too tired for teaching and you're late for sound checks because you had to leave at five and stuff yeah, in traffic and stuff. Yeah, driving back white in order to open the shop on the other yeah. side of the country. So everyone's just permanently crossed with you. So uh, that was why we uh, had to give up. <laughs> stems from your original question about are you happy with through and through then, isn't it? Because uh, in a way we do, but we are still playing that material and then we're going to stop any time soon. And we play it pretty differently. We play it very differently now and and it will, the new one is recorded as we sound now. Um, but also uh, we've got lots of guests on that one as well. All and people I, that we played with in some capacity over the years, you know. But mostly haven't recorded with. Can so. you give us any names? Eliza Carthy, uh, Martin Simpson, Martin Carthy, Maddie Pryor, Maddie Pryor, James Fagan and Nancy Kerr. Yeah, who we did um, a couple of tours with as a sort of quartet. Yeah. Um, and Ian Giles. Ian Giles. And um, Andy Cutting. Andy Cutting. Um, Dave Kowski. He's a melodeon player. <laughs> um, uh, uh, well, Dave, Dave Kowski is a banjo player who I played with a few sessions in, in Sheffield. So, uh, yeah, I think that's it really. Yeah. Essentially, it's fair. How about you? Sam and Hammer. Sam and Hammer, yeah. yes, essentially, <laughs> Hammer James. Pay healed. Yeah. Were the circumstances of the recording uh, different to the days of through and through recording in a day or recording in a church? No, or not, no, not, no. Not similar, no, no, very similar. <laughs> no, we were recording in a, in a village hall in Sheffield when Sheffield was under the snow. So we lost a day, didn't we? Because you were snowed in. I couldn't. Get or, out. or we I were snowed. Get out. <laughs> there was a perimeter around. It was around the day that everyone was saying nobody is doing anything in Sheffield, and I went up by train and on the tram. And yeah, yeah. And it was fine. Yeah. Um, and we turned the heat on. The only problem is that the schools were shut, so the the hall that we booked, which is a kind of a school hall attached to a church, is uh, just the, <laughs> just next to the best sledging sl place, <laughs> sledging hill in my valley. So it was just like about. 50 school, you know, secondary school kids throwing themselves down the hill screaming. So if you listen very carefully on the website, you might hear, hear them, that. Yeah. But, yeah. but the whole point is that we're, we're very, very pleased to have made it to 10 years of playing music and not, it doesn't look like it's, it's disappearing yet. So, you know, it's, to us, that's a massive achievement to have stayed yeah, doing yeah. it for that yeah. long. There's a lot of people that were starting out when we started out aren't, aren't doing music anymore. They're all falling like, you know. Like badges, aren't You're also celebrating with a gig in London in May. Yes. Yeah, I say yes. I mean, I'm very pleased to be doing the gig. It's quite nervous. Yes, London. London. Yes, London. <laughs> yeah, no, Chef's Bush Empire, which is great, which is lovely. Yeah. Very new. And that's, that's essentially going to just, that's going to be the party. When we set it up almost a year ago, we, we were basically seeing how many tickets we could sell in advance then and we know how many people we could afford to invite yeah. to come and play at the gig. But so well done everyone that has bought tickets for that gig because we can now, we now yeah. have the lineup that we have. If we sell it out we'll try and put Kylie Minogue or something. Yeah. She's my friend now. Yeah. Jules we haven't got that photo yet, have we? We need to get there's a great photo somewhere of us sitting uh, underneath Kylie Minogue. Yeah. She's sitting on Jules Holland's piano and we're kind of kneeling down underneath. Quite good.